By far my favorite 2019 gaming experience was the untitled Piss Game, starring Norman Reedus, Conan O'Brien and Kiefer Sutherland who does a brief cameo for some reason. The game focuses on the art of urination, with an online multiplayer component where players can complete each other's pee circles, with the rarest trophy in the game involving peeing the entire Book of Genesis in the snow. This video is definitely not sponsored by Monster Energy. So opinions are clearly divided on Death Stranding. The critics mostly liked it, the public was mixed, and some people voiced their opinion to a vitriolic degree so insane that Metacritic had to delete a bunch of negative reviews. One of my favorite channels, Super Bunny Hop, talked about Death Stranding's gameplay and how it related to his experiences while cycling across the United States. And it's, as expected, a fantastic video. Would recommend. This was my most anticipated game for 2019, and I really wanted to like it. And for a lot of it, I did, but... In so many areas, it just came up short, as you can probably guess by the title of this video. Let's look at how Death Stranding works in a full-on examination of this greatness buried by flaws. Or flaws buried by greatness? I don't know, I still have no idea what I'm gonna call this video. One of the most common criticisms about Death Stranding, both before and after release, was that it was a shallow walking simulator. I mean, for one, Death Stranding is most definitely not shallow, but in an ironic way, it does actually simulate walking, unlike any other game has done before, in an actually mechanically interesting way. Very early on, you're introduced to the slightly cumbersome cargo UI. Like, why can't I just press circle after adjusting my cargo? Why do I gotta specifically confirm it? But it's something I got used to after a while, and I do see the value of context-specific hold X to confirm moments, because Kojima has never been afraid of unconventional control schemes. Now, that doesn't change the fact that the first episode of the game is kind of... not fun. You need to get adjusted to the weight and walking system, balancing yourself while slowly making your way up a mountain to throw your mom, who is also the President of the United States, into an incinerator. Bye mom! It introduces you the mechanic of how to effectively plan your route, and how to take advantage of the tools in your disposal. Like I said, the game is definitely not shallow. The way you adjust your cargo is important for the sake of your balance. Don't strap overly heavy stuff to one side of your suit and leave the other empty. Don't stack your cargo stupidly on your back. Take advantage of vehicles, carriers, power suits and everything else they give you to make walking with gear less of a pain in the ass. Because no matter what, towards the end of the game you will still be tripping around the place and if you fall, your baby will cry at you annoyingly, just like in real life. <laughs> Some players have commented the relative lack of usefulness of the vehicles in a terrain like Death Stranding's, while some online video reviewers that I will not name have complained about the game while trying to drive a bike up a vertical wall. But I personally traversed a large chunk of the game entirely by bike or truck, and navigating even in the snowy mountains was surprisingly easy. I only destroyed one bike carelessly near the beginning of the game, but after getting used to it, I found it possible to go pretty much anywhere in my vehicle. And slow, yes, but totally possible, at the cost of fairly minor damage to my vehicles and cargo. Unlike what you may think, your biggest enemy in the game are not angry ghosts or package-hungry lunatics with stun guns, but the terrain. You're constantly fighting against rocks, slopes, mountains, crevices and other parts of level geometry that seem to be programmed with great detail and finesse. Just watching your step being an aspect of gameplay is an interesting idea, I'll give them that much. Your mission, should you accept it, not that you have a choice in the matter, is delivering stuff from point A to B and C on foot and in vehicles around a godforsaken wasteland that represents a heavily compressed USA. In the world of Death Stranding, the eponymous disasters caused the appearance of angry sludge ghosts known as BTs that attack people and kill them, causing cataclysmic explosions while rain that makes people and objects deteriorate falls from the sky. And that includes in snow form too. The apocalyptic Death Stranding split and divided the surviving Americans, most of whom live in underground bunkers, 3D printing most of their stuff. But they still require things like food to be brought to them by a foolhardy delivery fellas and fellettes. And that includes you. They also need to be united and connected through the chiral network, which is like a super internet of some description. These delivery assignments are like 90% of the main quests and side quests for Death Stranding. Some are quite interesting, like delivering a piece of technology to allow a doctor to operate on a sick woman remotely, and you have to do it within a time limit or she'll die. 
Or even the sillier ones, like delivering a sewing kit to Conan O'Brien's partner. Yeah, don't worry about me. I've got an otter one. <laughs> Come on. Come on, otter one? That's pretty good. Come on. Oh. But for the majority of them, there isn't too much interesting flavor text or dialogue in these orders. Some of them contain cum, apparently, and that's cool. And hearing people thank me or offer me upgrades for them is nice, but looking at generic NPC models through holograms and watching the same cutscene of Norman Reedus plucking them into the Kyle network can get a bit taxing. Some of these orders are the absolute worst, like the ones involving the junk dealer, for example. This guy acts like an absolute dickhead to you every time you go see him, despite you pulling off things like picking up stuff for him from BT-infested territory and delivering an hourglass to his wife by hand, meaning you can't use a vehicle and have to carry it by holding the trigger button the whole damn time. And that hourglass is later broken in a cutscene anyway, and then you have to carry his wife back to him in a body bag, forcing you to leave most of your carried items behind. Your reward is reuniting these two NPCs who you don't even care about, and let later you get an email where you find out that they've split again anyway. Fuck these missions. Still, these deliveries make up the core gameplay loop of the game, and seeing the network encompass more and more of the continental United States is satisfying. Actually bringing the deliveries, particularly when you're just calmly traversing through the unfriendly terrain, is kind of neat. It's probably really boring as an onlooker, but as a player, the feedback that I get as I progress in the vast open world is surprisingly satisfying and zen-like. Especially when a cool, chill, low roar song pops up, when you know you don't have to worry about the enemy encounters in this game. And speaking of the music, it's pretty great by the way. But it's a Kojima game, so it goes without saying. Ludwig, Louis Ludwig Forsell returns again after producing some absolute bangers for the Phantom Pain, and he's in top form. Mules, easily identifiable from all the orange, will run up to you and try to knock you out and steal your shit. They're apparently so addicted to packages and the likes they get from fulfilling orders that they're crazily just dedicating their lives to stealing packages from porters. This is like on the level of South Park's Amazon episode of Satire. See, this is clearly a game more about exploration and traversal than combat, and I like that. Kojima and his team managed to take what looks like a typical third-person action game and remove the action from the focus. But for whatever reason they weren't confident enough to make a game entirely about deliveries, I would have probably still liked if they had, but they inserted moments of non-lethal combat in there. And that comes down to... press square like three times and they're done. I have to compliment Kojima's team for the insane equipment variety in this game, and that includes gear meant for combat. Once you get those, combat becomes somewhat more satisfying, but also incredibly easy. The bola gun, the stun bombs, even non-lethal assault rifles and shotguns towards the end really mop up mules quickly, though they can still overpower you if you're too reckless. Of course, you can also try to avoid them altogether. For the most part, the mule camps are just speed bumps, but they have scanners everywhere that will alert them to your cargo real soon. You can make a long detour to get past the scanners, making the deliveries last even longer. They don't give you the chance to use the well-timed button presses to counteract their scanners until way later in the game, but when you do do it, it's extremely satisfying. Also, their camps are full of loot, which is mostly unnecessary because I almost never run out of opportunities to get stuff, but using the sticky gun to yank their stuff is another satisfying feature that actually requires skill, unlike blindly mowing the mules down. So remember I mentioned the deterioration rain? Well, that's actually a mechanic in the game. In theory, once you get the ability to do so, you can try to avoid the rainy areas because rain will slowly ruin your equipment and constructions. And rainy areas are infested with the angriest sludge ghosts, BTs, who are constantly stuck between life and death, apparently. And that kinda sucks for them. You get a taste of them early on, where your only option is really to run away or patiently sneak through while holding your breath, which fails often. And that stays that way for a few hours until you get the grenades made from your blood, piss, sweat and poop. And those grenades are surprisingly potent weapons against BTs. Now I get the idea, really. Getting past the BTs is like a puzzle. You need to use your baby-powered scanner to see them to begin with and avoid getting too close using either stealth or your weapons to get through them. It's pretty easy when you get used to it, and it's a cool concept. The problem is these encounters happen a lot, and they're almost always the same. Near the end, this red glowing asshole who refuses to die and chases after you is introduced, which is both cool and frustrating. Frustrating because the encounters with the BTs are really jarring and completely take you out of the gameplay of delivering packages. They last too long to be really engaging. And if you do manage to get caught by them, 
Well, get ready for a boss fight. Some of these BT bosses are mandatory, where others happen if you can't escape from them. The latter ones allow you to just leave the area usually, but to progress you usually have to take them out. Sadly, the bosses are a combination of very easy and very tedious. They are very telegraphed and easy to avoid attacks, and there are only like two variations of them. Although they sometimes pit you against two of these lion things at the same time, which gives at least some strategic element to them. They're tedious, however, because they're complete bullet sponges that eat up all your poop grenades and bullets. This drags the fights out way too much to my like. I played this game on normal, but I have no interest in increasing the difficulty, because I feel like they'll just give the bosses even more health or something and make them even more tedious. Even the massive BT boss at the end of episode 9 is barely different from the others. It has a couple of neat attacks, but again, it also comes with an obvious glowing weak spot. It's slow, and all of its attacks are easy to avoid. So have fun with that. Earlier on in the game, there's a whole episode you have to go through without your jar baby, meaning you can't detect PTs until they're right in your face, though the helpful and not at all jarring cutscene does alert you to their presence. This episode occurs amidst some of the most frustrating landscapes to navigate too, and of course having a vehicle does nothing to help you escape them, it actually makes things worse. I compliment the staff for mixing up the game's routine again, but I dislike how the BT encounters are railroaded. During that mission to save that mountain guy's wife, I knew I was gonna encounter BTs, so I thought I was being smart by choosing an alternate route and studying the map, only to run into a yet another BT nest on the way. The game is basically just shoving these encounters down our throat rather than rewarding strategy. By the way, at this point I'd like to mention that uh, I still like this game, and I think Hideo Kojima makes great games, I love every single one of them, and I love you, Kojima-san. For God in Japanese. Nandesu. Well, it's hard to explain. But placed after God, it would turn the sentence into, is God. Okay, so? Kojima is God. Cecile's name is a message. I don't believe it. Kojima is God. Kojima is God. Um, cuz? The online connectivity and interaction with other players is probably my favorite concept in Death Stranding. Games like Dark Souls and Nier Automata played with the asynchronous multiplayer concept but Death Stranding really does it to a greater degree. In the world of Death Stranding, you can 3D print practically anything in like 30 seconds as long as you have the correct materials. And you will need to, to print bridges, ladders, ropes, shelters and power generators around the map. Not only for you to get to your destination, but to help others as well. Even though I haven't found an actual use for all the likes you amassed in the game, except for leaderboards to compare who has the biggest Death Stranding dick, I actually don't mind. The story, which we'll get into later, is all about building connections, bridges in other words, with other people. And what better way to show this in gameplay than by allowing players to construct things to help others, donate some vital equipment like boots, blood bags and repair spray, and picking up cargo supposedly dropped by others, while rewarding each other with likes. It really gives you the sense of not being alone, even though you never encounter any friendly faces in your travels, in person anyway. Plus, I like the idea of thousands of Norman Reeduses running around this wasteland. Really, the only feeling better than finding a safe house when your vehicle is almost destroyed or finding a generator when you're almost out of juice is the little message you get when someone else uses a safe house or generator you made. Also, small touches like allowing you to build signs that give both helpful hints and slight boosts to movement speed or stamina, as well as marking places other players have rested or relieved themselves in, are just nice. I'd really like to know how the technical details work though. When I donate items, they will, to my understanding, appear in the locker of the postbox or shelter I drop them in. But what about the cargo and items I see dropped all over the place? Are people really just dropping them randomly? And who are these people throwing me items during boss fights? Why are they represented through the names of players who I can give likes to? I'm not complaining about this, I'm just very confused. Speaking of equipment, I do like what an insanely wide variety of tools you have in your disposal, and even more how you're introduced new tools gradually little by little, with new mechanics brought up even near the last episode of the game. But I also found shuffling through my inventory to organize my ever-growing need for exploration items annoying, and you have to leave room for materials to be able to build useful things or repair structures you come across on your trips. This all adds to the fatal flaw of Death Stranding's gameplay. The tedium, the endless grind. Playing it feels like work, and a lot of it has to do with the atrocious pacing of the story. Every Hideo Kojima game thus far has tried to say something, and that's a big reason as to why I stand this man. Even the weakest plotlines in Metal Gear had things to say, and Death Stranding makes a brave effort. The game is about unity during times of hardships, about how easy it is to divide us, but how it's also possible for us to work together, 
and gameplay complements this really well. Just as you are creating connections by doing deliveries and connecting cities and relay stations together, you're also doing the same with other players by helping them out and letting them help you. The game's main character, Sam Porter Bridges, is played by Norman Reedus in voice, appearance and motion capture. And while he does a great job with the material he's given, we're seeing another Kiefer Sutherland from MGS5 situation here. He barely talks. I guess it makes him seem cooler, because other characters do talk. And they talk a lot. Too many cutscenes just have Sam staring at the other character for 30 minutes as they drone on and on. As innovative as the game is, the plot progression is done primarily by, you guessed it, non-interactive long-winded cutscenes. Like, really long-winded. And story progression happens so sporadically too. Episode 2 is insanely long and nothing of importance really happens in it. In fact, nothing of importance really happens until maybe episode 4. Fragile has some actually interesting scenes in episode 3, and we are introduced to the game's, uh, villain, I guess? Higgs, voiced by Troy Baker, who hams it up in an entertaining way, but whose motivations are uninteresting and illogical, and who becomes a complete goofball by the end of his plotline, with him making dumb video game references as you beat the shit out of him in an actually pretty entertaining and fun, but completely unchallenging boss fight. A game of this production value honestly should have more dynamic and interesting cutscenes, but what we get really brings me back to Metal Gear Solid 4. Characters talk and talk, going over concepts of Death Stranding's world and dumping info on us, expositing endlessly, not leaving many mysteries to be solved or any plot details for the player to figure out on their own, like say in Metal Gear Solid 2, which I, along with 3, consider a benchmark for Kojima's writing. The characters drop in acronyms and concepts to us like we're in Final Fantasy XIII, and nearly all these conversations occur in visually pretty uninteresting spaces. We see so much of this private resting room in cutscenes that it makes me hard to concentrate in what's going on when my mind is dulled from all this tedium. Let's take a few examples. Mama is a genius engineer who supports you on your journey, initially by voice only, but we do meet her eventually. Her name pretty much defines her theme in the story, which is about motherhood, as her stillborn child has become a docile BT or whatever, and just chills around her all the time. She gives her plot exposition dump while Sam says almost nothing, we take her to her twin sister Lachne in a long drive across the map, and then she dies. But don't worry, Lachne looks and sounds just like her and fills exactly the same role, so there's no consequences. Also, the game looks great almost all the time, but there's some real uncomfortable uncanny valley territory in Mama's face. I don't know, something about the mouths in this game generally look off. Hartman has a nicely designed environment where you talk to him in, but his story is so over-the-top tragic and told to us in so exhausting detail that it loses any effect it could potentially have. Wouldn't it be better if Hartman's backstory was dropped to us in smaller portions across this episode? Revealed through maybe partially text, partially by himself, partially by other characters? Not that it matters anyway, because his condition and backstory have nothing to do with Sam or the main storyline, he's just a generic support character. Your CEO and the Colonel Campbell or Major Zero of the game is named Die Hartman, which actually doesn't feel that dumb after Hut Coldman. Considering how he has almost zero personality in his encounters for about the first 90% of the time, the plot twist regarding him near the end is actually quite good, so I won't spoil it here. And now that we're here, let's get into the acting. It's pretty damn great across the board, actually. Another important character whose storyline is actually quite good and effective is Cliff Unger, a soldier seemingly from another time who has an obsession with Sam's BB the famous pickled baby you're carrying around. Not only are the gameplay elements involving him and his gang of spooky skeleton soldiers actually different and decently fun, but he's played extremely well by Matt Mikkelsen in voice, appearance and motion capture. Also the fact that his story is actually delivered in seemingly inexplicable small flashes from BB's perspective is great, and the kind of storytelling this game needed more of. All the other actors do a great job also, even when the dialogue is kinda lame, though the things they say are less dramatic and over the top than in the Metal Gear games. I gotta give it to Norman Reedus and Matt Mikkelsen, of course, but probably the best performance of the game goes to Tommy Earl Jenkins as Die Hard Man, which is funny because most of the time his dialogue is just kind of bland exposition and giving you orders, but when you get to the end and learn more about him, it's actually kind of engaging. So after a bit more than 40 hours of playing, I got to episode 9, which felt like it was the ending, but I knew it couldn't be. Sure enough, there was the cool boss fight with Higgs, followed by an extremely corny scene with Sam and Emily. Great. So I'm Mario and you're Princess Peach. Okay. Yeah. Like Mario and Princess Peach. What? <laughs> and then some decently cool twists, and I'm thrown into episode 10. 
which is literally just go all the way back to point X with barely anything interesting happening on the way. We get another Cliff Unger Battlefield segment in episode 11, and our last real order in episode 12, which also features a huge BT boss fight that, once again, unfortunately, is just like any other goddamn BT fight without any real personality, although graphically it looks amazing. And then the rest of the game is pretty much just boring exposition at a decently fun but way too long quasi-interactive credits sequence. Of course, Higgs is not the real antagonist in the game, but was being controlled by another character whose motivations are also ill-defined and inconsistent. Episode 14 is the actual last episode, and it actually has a couple of really cool reveals that sort of make sense in retrospect, as well as scenes that are actually charming, thanks to us finally getting out of the boring parts, but it's still muddled by cutscenes that drag on way too long. Ultimately, since the rules of this fantasy setting are so badly defined and the characters so devoid of personality and charm, I ended up feeling nothing as the game's main story finally ended. It was an okay ending, one of the better parts of the story, but the parts preceding it were too underwhelming for me to be impressed. I know I skipped over a lot of stuff and there are side quests, secrets and easter eggs that I only saw like a fraction of that could have increased the game's value for me, but simply going out of my way to look for them just sounds very unappealing in a game like this. It feels like I've just been shitting on this game for the past 20 minutes or so, I apologize, but I really had high hopes for this one. Nonetheless, a lot of fans really enjoyed it, and I'm actually quite happy about that. The fact that this game was a success despite its off-the-wall trailers and unusual premise shows that we're in the right time for more cerebral and creative games. At least Death Stranding is a good prototype for a future game. With a bit more refined mechanics and more focus, as well as more originality for telling the story, the next Kojima Productions game could be something great. And maybe next time we don't need celebrities to meticulously motion capture characters. I just like a good, original off-the-wall story and gameplay that I'm used to getting from Hideo Kojima.